Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. No matter how you look at it, animal agriculture helps Nebraska's economy. The livestock industry provides increased tax revenues for schools and community services. Livestock enterprises also create jobs while contributing to existing businesses such as local banks and grocery stores. A thriving livestock industry helps maintain our current way of life, but also provides opportunities for the next generation of farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff helps to raise awareness of the importance of animal agriculture to Nebraska. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Jeff Peterson looks at corn and soybean markets. Ruth McDonald talks about the safety of GMOs in food. Steve Tun explains the importance of calving within the first 21 days. And Dave Aiken discusses the future of the Keystone XL pipeline. Jeff Peterson from Heartland Farm Partners is our marketing analyst this week. The USDA Monday updated its estimates on the sizes of the 2014 corn and soybean crops for the U.S. The production and average yield numbers for corn and soybeans are new records for those harvests. The average corn yield of 171 bushels per acre is a new high by 6.3 bushels per acre. The average soybean yield is a new top by 3.8. Nebraska will be the third largest corn producer for 2014 and the fifth biggest grower of soybeans. The agency also released its latest quarterly stocks report Monday, showing corn stocks up 7% from a year ago and soybean stocks 17% higher. We talked with Jeff Friday morning for his thoughts on the reports and how markets reacted. As we look at this crop report, let's start in corn. Give me your thoughts on the size of the crop and the stocks numbers that we saw Monday. Yeah, as we looked at the report, a uh, few surprises out there. Um, seeing the yield go down 2.4 bushels, I think was a shock a lot of people and actually only seeing the acres go up harvested went up about 39,000 bring those together though Jeff it still showed production off 191 million now how that flowed through to the bottom line that all important ending stock number we talk about they made another adjustment they actually ended up reducing the amount of feed demand by 100 million bushels so at the end of the day stocks were down 121 million from uh, last month it put us at 1.877 billion bushels about in line with I think what we were thinking, maybe, maybe a little bit below, but probably a little bit lower than what some in the industry thought. Let's move into soybeans then. First, the uh, size of the crop, and then the stocks number in that as well. Yeah, as we as we took a look at soybeans, you know, they ended up cutting uh, 300,000 acres out of the harvested number, which I was kind of a little bit of a surprise. Um, they did end up raising the yield up. They brought that up about three tenths of a bushel, uh, but at the end of the day, our ending stock stayed the same, right at 410 million. They were able to accomplish that by increasing that export number. They brought that up about 10 million bushels compared to last month. I think the last time we talked, you had mentioned that you thought soybean exports could go up farther. Just give me the export scene for soybeans right now. Boy, it's, it's amazing, Jeff. To kind of put it in perspective for you, this last week when the report came out on Thursday, it showed we still sold another 819,000 metric tons for the week. We only need to sell 19,000 a week going forward. What that really means is if we have one more week like that, we will match the USDA's export numbers for the year already. So the demand has been good on beans. Why has it been so good as we get ready to see a South American harvest here in a few weeks? I think that a little bit of the concern coming in, the main player being China, we talk about them a lot. You know, that South American crop got planted a little bit later than normal. And I think China is sitting there going, we're gonna buy a few extra beans, make sure that we don't get caught short so that we can get the amount of supply that we want in case there's any problems problems getting it from the field to the ship. What are your thoughts on the size of this South American crop? And obviously when you look to South America, a lot of the attention gets paid to Brazil. Yeah, the main attention is on Brazil. You know, if we were to focus really our attention on really kind of the Northeast area and really drill it down to two main particular growing areas, um, Bahia and, and Minas Gerais, that area makes up about 6.5% of the production. 
for Brazil, that area has been a little dry. And there has been some concern that that dryness is going to spread. However, what we're seeing is we're seeing that ridge break down, we're seeing some additional moisture come in. Um, I don't think we can say the ridge is completely gone yet, but our forecast would show in another three, four days, we should see some improved precip coming through many of those areas. I want to step back to the reports and tell me how markets reacted after those reports came in on Monday and then, you know, in the subsequent days. Yeah, you know, once those reports came out, everybody, you find out where everybody's positioned, right? Um, on the day of the report, which had been back on Monday, corn tried to work its way higher. You know, it, it worked up higher during the course of the day. Beans really right out of the gun started its way lower and worked its way lower. And, and as we look at through the week, we've seen both corn and beans just kind of grinding their well, self lower, coming back to some kind of some key support areas, but it's still on a downtrend here. Moving into oil, what effect, if any, have sustained lower oil prices had on either corn or beans? Yeah, they've definitely have had an impact. It's hard to believe, uh, thinking back to just October, that really prices for oil were twice what they are now. Um, it has had an impact. I think the biggest impact can be seen on, on really the ethanol stocks. Uh, right now, what the situation is, is you've got ethanol at a, a nine-year low. Unfortunately, the price of ethanol is still above the price of gasoline. So any of that discretionary blending we've talked about, ultimately that ends up uh, not happening. So then we switch over and look at the, from the production side. So far, production is, is held in there very strong. Year to date, we're up about 5.3%. USDA only believes we're going to be up about eight tenths of a percent, but a big concern. The concern is a lot of the margins, as we look at just the board margins for those plants right now, they are showing some negative returns. And so that's going to have an impact on that industry unless they've hedged themselves going forward. Do you maintain your positive outlook on ethanol, though, as we go for 2015? Well, that's a complicated one. Yeah. You know, the last time we kind of talked about this, we had oil prices higher than where we were today. Yeah. But I think the big key as we come into it um, is ethanol demand from here forward, could it drop? We, it can drop a little bit, but in order for that to happen, what's going to have to happen is I think we'd have to see a reduction by EIA for the 2015 mandate. If they don't come in and change that, I, I still think we're going to come in pretty close to USDA's number on the ethanol side. So where corn is right now, where beans are right now, how do you explain the value, overvalued, undervalued? Yeah, I think what we can do is let's first start, let's roll back time to October. What's happened since October to now is because the, the funds actually have came in and they bought about 1.5 billion bushels with a B of, of grain, of corn and beans. That took this market high, got it overvalued. Initially that happened because of the tightness in soybeans. I think there's still a premium being carried in the soybeans because of the unknown yet on the size of the South American crop. The corn one's a tougher one to, to go ahead and, and wrap the mind around. You know, we felt that it got overvalued mainly on speculative and technical trading, not based on where the fundamentals were at. Next week, Mike Briggs will join us to look at cattle markets. The Associated Press said this week a majority of people in this country support labeling genetically modified foods. A recent poll conducted in part by the AP found 66 percent of Americans are in favor of requiring manufacturers to label foods containing GMOs. Only 7 percent were against labeling. While the two-thirds support was overwhelming, only four in ten said GMOs in food were either very or extremely important to them. Ruth McDonald is a professor and chair at Iowa State's Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition. She spoke last week to an audience at the Fremont Corn Expo about the safety of GMOs in food. We talked with her there about that topic and began by asking how much the general public understands about genetic modification in agriculture. I think it's pretty limited what people know about GMO and how it affects their food. I think if you're in the Midwest, you probably have a working knowledge about what GMOs are and, and crops, but I find even among students at Iowa State University, there's a real diversity in what people understand about how food is produced. And I think if you go further out from the Midwest, you get more and more people who don't have a real familiarity with agriculture. So tell me about its use in food production. What's used, what's not used? Well, right now, uh, in the U.S., corn, soybeans, and sugar beets are the primary food uh, crops that are produced with GMO technology. The problem with that, or the situation with that, is that we use corn and soybean and sugar in a lot of food. So we extract oil, we extract cornstarch, we extract soy proteins, and of course sugar and high fructose corn syrup and those sort of ingredients all come from genetically modified corn and soybean and sugar beets. So 
Um, it's in a lot of foods. It's not necessarily in foods in its natural state that would have come out of the, of the crop, however. Okay, see, so I hear people say that uh, if you have it in the grocery store and it's not labeled organic, just assume that it's genetically modified. Is that accurate? If it, if it contains um, corn oil, cornstarch, uh, soy products, soy, soy ingredients, probably yes. It's probably going to have come from a genetically modified crop. Okay, the broad question, is it safe? Yes. Why? There's no evidence from years of use of genetically modified foods of any risk to human health or animal health. And there have been substantial studies to show that there is no connection between any specific disease and genetically modified foods. And there really isn't any logical, physiological you know, explanation for that. Why is the fear there then? I think it's a scary sounding sort of terminology. You know, genetically modified organisms sounds like a bug or a pest or something and really uh, it's, it's, a, it's a technique of using DNA, specific sequences of DNA that express a trait that you would like to have in that crop. And um, I think it's confusing to people to understand how that happens and, and what it actually, to follow it along in the food system. It's, it's very complicated. Do you think that food should be labeled based on whether or not it's gen genetically modified? I want people to know what's in their food. I don't think that putting a genetically modified food ingredient label on a food is going to change their understanding about genetically modified food. And I believe that the cost to the food industry and to consumers that that would entail to go through the process, the legal issues associated with labeling of that, is not worth the public health safety because there is no public health safety. There's no benefit to the consumer from their health perspective, uh, it's just um, you know wanting to know. And, and I think that there are options for consumers that do want to avoid genetically modified foods. It's not going to be very simple to do that because you know it is so abundant in our food supply. How do farmers, how, do, how does agriculture bridge that gap to letting people know what's in this? I think it's very difficult to find a way to communicate this information on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, we, we have such technology tools now where people can communicate uh, without really knowing what they're talking about. So you can have a blogger and someone who has a certain perspective on something and they can have a lot of followers. And um, you know, it's difficult to kind of get factual information inserted into that conversation. So I think we just have to do the best we can. We try to educate our students, you know, and we try to start with that. I think we need to do more in public schools and we need to do more with just um, you know, conveying information in a way that reaches people where they're being, where they're seeking that information. Because it's so tough, do you think this debate will still be going on in the same scope in the next 10 to 20 years? I don't know. I, it's a good question. I, I think that it's a very, um, I, two things. I think that the technology is moving quickly. So I think that what we do with GMO technology today will not be the same as what we use in the future. So that's going to be a continually moving sort of target. Um, so I think that there's going to be advances being made in the technology that are going to change the dialogue a little bit. I think that consumers are always going to be wanting to know about what is in their food and, and how it's produced. I, I think a lot of this cycles though, and I think there'll be some ups and downs in, in what people are interested in. Next week we'll talk about genetically modified animals with Allison Van Enenim from UC Davis. Allison spoke this week on UNL's Innovation Campus as part of the Huerman Lecture Series. Nebraska's agricultural retailers are preparing to serve the growing cover crop movement. In the January Nebraska Farmer, several dealers explain how they're planning to make recommendations to farmers about growing cover crops. They're also gearing up with seeding equipment for farmer clients. Manufacturers are working to meet the demand for cover crop equipment. The January Nebraska farmer says this is one more indication of the surging interest in cover crops and the resulting demand for advice. You can read more about it in this month's issue. In our previous episode of Market Journal, we discussed some things farmers and ranchers can be doing now to get ready for the calving season. This week, Nebraska Extension Educator Steve Tun joins us to talk about why the timing of calving is important. 
We talked with Steve Wednesday afternoon and began by asking about the calving cycle. We have a 21-day heat cycle in cows, and so um, the calving period is broken into 21 days into each one of those heat cycles when they're bred. So why is it so important to calve within the first 21 days? Well, the obvious differences or obvious advantage mm -hmm. is that those calves are going to be heavier at weaning time and going to generate some more money. But UNL Extension Research has also shown that there's an advantage to those calves throughout their lifetime. Um, research at the, the Goodmanson Sand Hills Laboratory, over 10 years of calving data showed that steer calves born in the first 21 days of, of, their, of the calving season had an advantage in heavier carcass weights. Uh, greater percentage of those calves with quality grades or better marbling scores and a greater carcass value. And for heifers, mm -hmm. it was shown that the, the heifers that are born in the first 21 days of calving have an advantage over their mates by um, starting to cycle earlier or reaching puberty earlier for the next breeding season, as well as having greater percentage of, of pregnancy rates. So whether you keep them at weaning, you take them to harvest, or you keep them as replacement heifers, those early calves really have an advantage. What impacts does it have for the cow when she calves within the first 21 days? Well, there's, there's a really connection between early calving and cow productivity because those early cows that calve early in the season, they have um, a tendency to rebreed sooner in the next breeding season and as a result, stay longer in the herd. They produce more, ca more calves over the lifetime? That's right. Uh, some research work at uh, South Dakota State they studied some of their, their cow herds, the heifer calving records from their cows, as well as from the Meat Animal Research Center, and showed that heifers calving in the first 21 days of the calving season had a two calf lifetime production advantage over heifers calving later. Two calves. Yeah, you, you have a breakdown here of, of where you think maybe people should target to calve within those 21 days, but between the periods, I guess I should say. What, what do you like people to target? Well. Reproductive efficiency or, or performance is really the key to determine whether your cows and heifers are fitting your production system. So some goals to strive for would be to have 65% uh, of your mature cows calving in that first 21 days, 85 to 90% of your mature cows calving by 42 days, and 95 to 100% by day 65. And now the more important question, how do you get those calves calving with, or those cows calving within <laughs> the first 21 days? Well, nutrition, herd health, uh, management, uh, genetics all come into play, but if you're thinking of keeping replacement heifers, selecting those, those early born calves as replacements, that helps you kind of build up that or at it, fertility for your entire cow herd. And, and because of longer longevity, uh, increased sustainability and profitability, that's how you make that cow herd uh, even better. On the Market Journal website, we'll link to more information and data on the benefits of calving within the first 21 days. Through nearly 1,200 miles of 36-inch diameter pipe, the Keystone XL pipeline would carry crude oil from the province of Alberta in Canada to Steel City, Nebraska. Before linking up near the Kansas border, it would also cut through Montana and South Dakota. The company behind the pipeline, TransCanada, originally mapped its route through the Nebraska Sandhills. As you'll hear in a minute, that plan was eventually scrapped, and nearly a year ago, Nebraska Governor Dave Heineman approved an alternate route. His authority to give the green light was the subject of a district court case, and last week, an appeal ruling from the Nebraska Supreme Court that narrowly sustained the 2012 oil pipeline statute. But it's likely not over yet. Thursday morning, we talked with Nebraska Extension Water and Ag Law Specialist Dave Aiken about the future and controversy of the Keystone XL pipeline. It's been very controversial. Uh, the original pipeline route went through the Sand Hills, which was strategically a very poor choice. Uh, after a lot of hassle, they came up with a new route that largely avoids the Sand Hills uh, that was approved by Governor Heineman in January 2013, and so the new route is a much better route. Not only the Keystone XL pipeline, but condemnation, TransCanada being able to take the land, that's also been very controversial. That's right. Uh, to build this pipeline, they're going to have to condemn. It's, it's inconceivable that they won't have to condemn significant amounts of right away in order to build a pipeline. And, but they need the state approval in order to have that pipeline condemnation authority. So what was the Nebraska Supreme Court ruling about? Well, last year, the Lancaster County uh, District uh, Judge ruled that the pipeline statute giving uh, 
TransCanada, this condemnation authority was unconstitutional because it gave authority to the governor that the, that the Constitution gave to the Public Service Commission or to the legislature. And so, uh, that, uh, and so that meant that when that happened, they lost their condemnation authority. But they appeal. What happens on appeal? Well, uh, on appeal, the Nebraska Supreme Court voted four to three to follow the same ruling as the district court judge. But in Nebraska, you need five votes on the Supreme Court to, to strike a statute down. So it was four against, but f it, you need five, so the statute stands and uh, they have their condemnation authority back. What happens next now, Dave? Well, um, as soon as Trans, well, Trans Canada only has until uh, January 22nd to exercise this condemnation authority, so they'll need new legislation to extend that. Uh, and that hasn't been introduced yet in the legislature. But uh, as soon as they condemn property for somebody who's against it, uh, then they'll have, they'll go back in court and we'll start this court thing all over again. So the pipeline fight is not over in Nebraska? No. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, when it goes to the Supreme Court, all seven justices will now then need to be, will be required to consider whether it's constitutional or not. And then we'll just have to see what happens. So. You think it's likely that a new lawsuit would come out challenging the pipeline law. What would that mean? Well, it means considerable delay in terms of getting the pipeline uh, finished. Uh, and, you know, if, if TransCanada wanted to speed things up a little bit, they could go ahead and, and file their uh, revised application with the Public Service Commission to get their approval and just say, we're, we're going to try to, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to worry about whether this is constitutional or not. But uh, at this point, they don't seem willing to do that. Uh, and if they do it the hard way, you know, it, it could end up adding another two years at least to this pipeline project. Tell me about Nebraska as it stands, right? So, because we see this happening in Washington and the Senate and the House talking about this. If the president would sign a bill right now, he had been waiting on the Nebraska Supreme Court, correct? Right. So if he would sign the bill now, what would happen? It's still, we'd still need to get this uh, condemnation issue resolved in Nebraska. And, uh, you know, with four votes, uh, uh, of the four vote, of the, four, of the justices that voted on the constitutional issue, it was four to nothing that it was unconstitutional. And so I'd say there's a pretty good chance that one of those three judges also thinks it's unconstitutional, but they didn't want to do that. Uh, they do that as last resort. And so I think if it goes to the Supreme Court again, it'll probably be found unconstitutional by at least five justices. And if that happens, then they have to pass a new law, have to have a new review process, and so no matter what they do in Washington, Nebraska, it's going to be two or three years before we get it straightened out in Nebraska. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here again for the weekly forecast. During this last week, of course, we finally seen that warm-up that we had advertised last week. Some very nice conditions with temperatures moving in most locations up into the upper 40s, low 50s as we got into the late part of the week. We did have a little cool air, of course, move in during the early part of the week, and it was slow to erode as it moved toward the east. It did set off a few flurries and light snow reports across extreme southern Nebraska and, and the Panhandle, but overall we had no, no significant accumulations of anything. And, of course, this cold stretch was the longest stretch that we've seen in regard to below normal temperatures since that cold break that we had during the early part of November. So as we go forward in time, what we're looking for is a slight cool down uh, to just about normal to below normal temperatures for a couple days in the early part of this forecast. And then we start to see a warming trend as we get into next week late next week as the ridge starts to rebuild back in and bring that warmer air from our west into our region. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see how this week will progress. And as we go to the upper air models, the first thing I'll draw your attention to is we have a quick moving wave that is going to slide rapidly toward the east. So temperatures are likely to remain steady or slightly falling as the day progresses and that cold air will rapidly move toward the east. We may see a little few flurry activity uh, in northwestern Iowa and possibly into portions of northeast Iowa, but overall we're not expecting anything in the way of sensible weather. And as we go into tomorrow, you'll see that trough has rapidly moved toward the east coast and here we have this ridge starting to build back in. So we'll see some moderating temperatures, maybe a degree or two warmer than we have today. But more importantly, as we get into Monday, we're going to have a downsloping flow component in the western Nebraska that's going to allow for some compressional heating and that'll allow us to return back up into the 40s to possibly low 50s across western Nebraska. 
much cooler across eastern Nebraska and especially northeast Nebraska where this frontal wave will start to push into our region and bring the next shot of cold air. There will be some flurry activity across the northern plains and as we get into Tuesday, some of that will spread southward. Right now it doesn't look like any significant moisture, more or less just flurries with the best location across the western one-third of the state as this cold air dams up against the Rocky Mountains. Now as we get into Wednesday, we'll start to see that trough lifting toward the Great Lakes and there may be some light snow or flurries across the extreme northeastern and possibly even east central Nebraska. And then as we get into Thursday, this trough starts to move toward the east and we get this ridge pushing in with warmer temperatures moving into our region. And by Friday, once again, that ridge starts to be a dominant force, but there is another wave to our, the northwest that looks to start moving in as we get into the uh, late weekend to early the following week that may bring another Arctic air surge. So as we look at the temperature forecast, we are looking at some fairly nice conditions this weekend. We're still going to be above normal. Um, we'll start to see some of that cool air starting to work its way in on Monday. And by Tuesday, we'll get the full brunt of that cold air with some scattered flurries, particularly across the north and west. And some of that will continue into Wednesday across northeast Nebraska before we start to see temperatures moderating as we go forward in time. Now, as we look at the 8 to 14 day forecast, with that ridge coming in and that cold air starting to move down, we're looking at normal to below normal temperatures across the center part of the country. And in terms of precipitation, with that cold air, we're going to get that upslope flow as the cold air dams against the Rocky Mountains. And this may generate some precipitation, particularly in the western one half of Nebraska. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews can be found on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on corn and soybean markets, GMOs in food, the importance of calving within the first 21 days, and the Keystone XL pipeline. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Next week, Mike Briggs will analyze cattle markets and we'll talk about genetically modified animals. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. And major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation.